back. If you're just joining us, welcome to BB Kings. I'm Marnie Sednow from Media Ocean, and we are delighted to present the agency track for you. So you're up for a treat. Man hugs and beards are contemporary business cultures just fashion or serious ROI. Uh, I'm going to present to you Charles Fallon, senior partner at SI Partners, to kick it off. So, warm welcome. Grab a seat. Good morning, everybody. Or afternoon. Okay, so we're going to have a chat about contemporary cultures. I'll come to the name in a minute of the title. Um, but just a bit of introduction for myself. Uh, we're very fortunate because we work around the world here in New York, also in Hong Kong and London and Europe. And we spend a lot of time working with entrepreneurs who are in the creative or technology industries. And culture, the way that our clients lead their businesses, both is the exciting part, but also sometimes the problem in terms of how businesses develop and, and grow. And I'm very lucky to have four panelists with me, and I'm going to fire some questions all about con contemporary culture. Which ones work? Do we need a contemporary culture to be competitive in this day and age? What happens if I'm working for a more traditional one, and how can uh, really, how can t traditional cultures keep up or be, be competitive? Or do I need to change at all? Um, and I'm joined first with, uh, on my right, is uh, Dr. Dana Ardi, who uh, is a leader in the human capital movement, uh, a corporate anthropologist, for those of you uh, who've never met one before, and author of a, a recent book called uh, The Fall of the Alphas. So Dana is incredibly well qualified to really talk about the difference between the traditional and, and, and the modern. Uh, and next is, uh, next, next to Dana is Alison Johnson. Alison has a new business called West, um, which is an accelerator, working with clients to develop new products and services. But you probably know her well in her previous role, which was at Apple, where she was VP of Marketing and Communications. So welcome, uh, Alison. And it's all girls. It's interesting. It's all girls. <laughs> We'll come to you in a minute, Mills. Uh, and, uh, and the third, uh, Kathleen, Kathleen Saxton, uh, who's a good friend of our firm and is founder and chief executive of Lighthouse, who I don't think we're allowed to call them headhunters anymore. It's more about talent management and nurturing talent. Uh, and our fourth member, and the only man in the panel, as you can gather, is Mills, uh, co-founder of two, at least two businesses. One is Dice, which is a, a new ticketing business, but... Probably what he's here for this, uh, this week is Us2, which is a product and service design studio both in New York, London, and Malmo. And if you don't know where Malmo is, it's in Sweden. Um, and perhaps recently most famous for winning an app award with their game called Monument Valley. So uh, uh, Mills is here to represent the men uh, and the hugs and the beards. So we'll get him to respond in his unique way. <laughs> Um, so the first question is, um, let's just talk about the title of, of contemporary culture. You know, what is or what are the attributes of a contemporary culture? And perhaps if I can start with you, Dana, what, what are the ingredients? So I think uh, what we're seeing is things are changing. It was uh, historical that companies would organize themselves in what I call a World War II paradigm, which was very hierarchical based on the pyramid where there was a CEO on top and chain of command that came from that, based on the military model. And that came into prominence in the industrial age when people got back from World War II. They were used to following suit, and so it just seemed illogical and a very clean and neat way to organize themselves at work. Things are changing, though, in technology, the women's movement, the human rights movement, people coming into the workforce with different tools of collaboration has changed what's happening not only in technology businesses and advertising-driven businesses, but in all businesses. And we're seeing the age of what I call collaboration, cultures that really foster the development of teams and team play, more like an orchestra uh, where everybody comes in with a virtuoso and they play together 
as opposed to this military model. Right. Alison, from your Apple days, what are the possibly contemporary elements? Well, there's a woman on the executive team for the okay. first time, which is awesome. Um, in my opinion, it's not happening fast enough. Um, I think I think Dan is right. We're at a tipping point. Obviously, the technology industry comes under a lot of fire for not having um, as many women in leadership positions as as uh, deserve to be there yeah. and as they should. Um, and I think that um, certainly that sort of the level of, of scrutiny and pressure on that uh, is going to increase. Um, and I think. Uh, some of the work that's happening around gender equality is probably uh, going to start to take hold. So early days, but yeah. um, uh, you know, an, an important an important movement to take hold. Uh, Mills, you are a contemporary culture. What what's oh, different about it? <laughs> yeah, beards, of course. Um, <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable about this name. With this, um, mine is a fake beard. Um, <laughs> It's very, it's a very apt question. I think for the last I, ten years ago, I think me and my partner started this business that was kind of based on friendship. And two hundred people later, I think um, at the very heart of it, friendship still is like a big part of what drives our community. I think um, over the last few years, something I was only talked about yesterday in our studios is kind of I felt that we've been falling into the sort of trap of kind of maybe the thing you were talking about of like being very easy to. to um, to kind of fall behind, accidentally fall behind some sort of hierarchies and people locked away in a room making decisions for the good of the community. And I think that's where now we're actually actively trying to totally change that and empower the whole community to kind of have a role in leadership and, and, and sort of share that burden of leadership. Because uh, from my, my opinion is that gone are the days where the more experienced you are in our industry, the, the better you are, I think. Actually, more often not, the fresher you are, the newer you are, probably the more you understand this industry, and I think that's something we've had to have to address, and that's why I want to change the way we do leadership in terms of truly empowering sort of you know, graduates, everyone, to kind of have a big impact on the decisions we make. So, I mean, I haven't done it yet, but we're trying. Kathleen, you've seen lots of different cultures. You're Absolutely. recruiting people for the complete mix. So what, yeah, what, what clients, makes a contemporary? Well, they go everywhere. From our clients go everywhere from Facebook, Twitter, BuzzFeed, all the way through to traditional advertising agencies, if you like. And I think that... The, to me, the positive is everything is becoming possible. You are seeing chief executives, if they're ready, in their early 30s, going into running a big business. And if they're ready, that's the biggest question of all. But I think you're also finding, you know, if someone is continually curious, it doesn't matter how established or what kind of business they work for, they'll keep innovating within that business, and that comes in through the culture. But there's no doubt that every business has one, whether you like the culture or not, or you want to change it or not, it already has one. So the question is, to, is whether or not you're truly understanding what the culture is and therefore what you can do to get behind that, to push it to become a more positive thing for the company. And we have lots of businesses that will ask me to find the chief executive in the hope that that will change a bad culture. Right. And of course it can't. So it can go some way, but it can't be everything. So that's always the big, big challenge that we're asked about. So to go back to you, Mills, on the next, next point, founders yeah. obviously create their culture because you and your founder have personalities, the way you like to work. But as now you're in three time zones, yeah. how, do you, how do you carry on when you can't be in the room the whole time? <laughs> Good point. Uh, not very well. Um, well, I guess, uh, I mean, uh, for, for nine years, I pretty much refused to sort of put any sort of vision statement together or sort of principles. And I think that's because I always knew in my heart that what those things, I, I knew what I believed in, but I think I've... I probably, as we've scaled, it's harder for me to. I'm not in a room with everyone, and it's. We've had. Oh, fuck, what am I even talking about? Um, what was the question again? The question is, <laughs> how, how, when businesses progress, yeah. when, they, when they're little, it's just the founders. Yeah. And you can control everything. Yeah. But eventually, size means you can't be in the room. So, how do you hold some of those values? How do you hold the, keep the behavior as you want? but well, you I trust other people, I suppose. Well, I guess, I mean, I guess role modelling became... I mean, I'm hyper-aware now of like, what role modelling actually means. I don't think I was before. Like, right. the way that we act together is definitely has a knock-on effect. You know, that our friendship, again, is like at the heart of everything we do, and that's... I would hope that everyone sort of buys into that. Um, I think it's also a massive about empowerment. I mean, I don't want to be... I'm not as talented as most of the people that are at the studios, so my role is really to actually empower others and kind of support from, from underneath and... Yeah. and and yeah, I guess, I don't know, it's a hard one, it's really hard. I think, I'm not sure who's cracked it yet. 
Dana, you, you guided a lot of, well, very famous contemporary businesses through that growth phase. What, what's, what are the tricks of the trade as well? So I think we're starting to talk about them, and, and uh, tipping point is a good word. How do you get a culture to adapt something that becomes a tipping point? Uh, the name of the session today, Man Hugs. There was an article last week in the New York Times about how the tradition of shaking hands has been replaced by men actually hugging. How did that happen? So change does happen. It becomes part of the contemporary culture and contemporary thinking. It happens over time by showing role models, by imaging. Uh, as Kathleen said, things change anyway. Cultures are living organisms, and things will happen. So you have to really get on top of it and make sure that there are shared values. You're communicating effectively uh, throughout the team. You have role models or mentorship for the right behavior. It's rewarded in the culture. Uh, when people step out of line, it doesn't derail the culture or take it to a bad place. The community polices itself. And so, you know, there are lots of guardrails you can put to grow and evolve the culture. It, it, it does change. It is dynamic. I mean, uh, part of my practice is to help big companies think small and small companies think big without losing their heart and soul. Yeah. And so you, ha you don't need mission statements. You really need clear communication and really good values. I, I, think. I think also, yeah. I mean, authenticity for me is, plays a big part. I mean, I think people are not stupid. I mean, we're, you know, we're in the... We're hiring, you know, what we believe, you know, truly the greatest people that we can find, and, and they're not stupid. And I think you can see people when people are completely bullshit or making these up and just using buzzwords, and whether or not the actual founders or the leadership actually believes in what they're trying to do. So I think authenticity. And Alison, is big. from your perspective of working with one of the largest contemporary cultures, what was the ingredients of success when it comes to Apple truly operating on a on a global scale? I'm not sure I would give them an A plus on culture. Okay. Um, so uh, let's dissect that a little bit. Um, I think what made Apple's culture great is that you know there was a very strong CEO with a very strong set of values, yeah. um, and. Basically, one of the things that was really interesting about the role that I was in is that you know we had six or seven hundred people working in marketing and communications, where the essence of the brand sort of reached outside of the company and into the world. And so, how did you do that? Um, especially when you have six or seven hundred people, most of them probably weren't born at the time that Apple, uh, you know, that Steve even, it's, you know, founded the company. So, um, how do you transfer values? How do you transfer culture? I mean, it was something that basically, we didn't, we didn't have any brand guidelines, we didn't have any brand books, there were no, it was no manuals. Um, it was something that basically you had to sort of intuit and understand, and it came from a very strong CEO and a powerful sort of point of view on the world. Um, and so that's one way to build culture. Do I believe that that was the healthiest culture I've ever um, been part of? No. Um, it was a culture that was really um, driven by fear as opposed to love, and I think you can get the same results driving from the place of love than from fear. Yeah. Um, but super high performance culture, super um, committed to doing the best work in the world. So he set a very high standard for what kind of work and what kind of people he wanted in the company, um, and we had to operate at that level, or you didn't make it across the finish line. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say, I think that's the culture we're displacing and the, and the culture that, that Dan is talking about that's going away and, and, and being replaced by it. But it's kind still of leadership and it's the idea that people could innovate and be creative. And I think those are elements of contemporary cultures yeah. that we're seeing more and more and that's very exciting to me. I think it's been reported to us as well. I think you're finding that we do a survey every year, for example, that asks people what it is that either keeps you in the job that you're in or is, is motivating you to change. And, of course, money and status and those things play a part, but they're not the number one. It tends to be, can I get on a mission with someone or with something where I can actually do great work, solve difficult problems, be around really intelligent people? Can I get behind the value of that? And can I actually make a difference? And can I progress myself in doing that? And I think, when I have two sides to how I feel about someone like Google, for example. I can argue both sides of how I feel about them. But the positive of that organization is you are working absolutely as a team. You're there to help each other to be better. And you're surrounded by very intelligent people. And if that matters to you, that will keep you there a lot longer. 
So, staying with you, Kathleen, then, the, it, this appears to be a bit easier to do when you've got a small business. So, when things get bigger, what are the ingredients which you have to hold on to? We've heard words like values and certain type of leadership. And when you're trying to recruit people and you're trying to explain the culture... Yeah. And they're going through that transition. I think the best thing you can do in that situation is to really give examples of the behaviour that those values have to emit. And I think you can never underestimate how much you need to reinforce that when you are interviewing people so they fully understand what an iteration of that value actually looks and feels like. Um, and even in, in businesses that we work with where they're transitioning between that sort of critical 200 to 400 phase and then beyond and beyond again... It's in that dilution sometimes from the founders or the CEO that you can then get into tricky water. So I think having a set of lieutenants that are your probably executive team or whatever, that all of them are very clear around what it is we do and what we don't do. All of those people can help you to then make sure that that flavor carries on in, a, in a, the best possible strength <coughs> that you can have. Mills, what's the future hold when it gets bigger and bigger? It's amazing. Um, <laughs> no, I just... Add into that, I just think, I just the more I think about it, like communication is the, for me, is just like the absolute key to everything. I mean, transparency and communication, in the absence of transparency or, or lack of proper communication, like, you know, the community starts to sort of make up their own mind about things. And I think that's where, that's not a good thing. I think continuously making sure that you're outputting, you're talking to everybody and like letting everyone know what's going on in the business is super, super important. Um, and also, and, like empowerment is, is super key. Like you know, I guess if you're if you're bringing super driven people who want to get somewhere, you have to let them actually get somewhere. You have to support that. At the same time, I personally believe in the good of the community as a whole, and I'm not interested in bringing people in to think about themselves and like a title chasing. I think that personally, I think that world is dead. I think if you're interested in what your title is, then I'm going to say something about them, but I won't. <laughs> Alison, the the the, the idea that. Um Traditional businesses can become contemporary. Can can you can we shift stuff, or do we just have to throw stuff away and start again? Can we make those kind of changes inside these bigger institutions, if we call them that? I think it's possible. I think it's very hard. Um, I think that there are potentially pockets where change can happen, and if that can spread, um, then I think there's potential. I think Howard Schultz did that um, at Starbucks. Um, <clears throat> I think. Uh, at various points in time, IBM has gone through those kinds of, yeah. of, of transformational moments. So it's possible, but it's hard, and I think it's the exception rather than the rule. Mm. And again, a really strong leader to drive that, or is there other ingredients other than that? Uh, I, I do think that leadership is required. Mm. Uh, strong leadership is required. So if Howard Schultz could make change. Right. Steve Jobs could make change. Yeah. Um, those are the kinds of exceptional leaders that I think... Um, can do that at scale. And Dana, when you come across the big trying to remain nimble or smaller, do you look at some and just think, this is a hopeless case, I can't help them, or do you take everyone on and say, <laughs> we can all get there? Uh, I, I'm the eternal optimist, so I believe change is possible. Um, but as Allison said, uh, it's not easy, and there's got to be a willingness, and it's not just the leader who calls me into his office and says, we're, we're going to change. I'm going to mandate it, because that's not how it happens. I mean, you really need a whole shift in consciousness, and it doesn't happen overnight, so you have to move the culture. So there are lots of techniques. Um, working with one uh, large enterprise where we're getting the senior executive team to go out and work in startups and go visit and do sort of Iron Man visits. So they say, oh, they have big ahas, because they haven't experienced that. We're putting teams together. We're getting them back out in the field so that they're close to the customer because it's not done the way they did it anymore. Things have changed a lot. And so, you know, how do you get people to embrace change, to find it fun, to find that they're evolving, to, you know, and as Mill said, it's not about hierarchy. It's not about age. Some of the best ideas come from leaders, but not leaders that you annoy, but leaders that arise from from the troops, and it could be somebody at the reception desk, or it could be, you know, the programmer that comes up with some great new development. So, you know, leadership is about listening and about finding the best ideas and about encouraging enterprises, big and small, you know, to be nimble enough to incorporate those changes into what they're doing. And, you know, those are for people who grow up uh, uh, in the 50s and the 60s, that's harder behavior. 
the generations, the subsequent generations, are embracing change in different ways. And so I'm very optimistic about it. Kathleen, so, sorry. Kathleen, when you get invited in and the existing, the establishment say, we need to change our business, we want a new man or woman even to, to, to do this, do you look at them and say, this is probably not a brief for me because I'm setting this up for failure or... Has, Do you have a conversation about it? It has happened, I, and as much as I love the fact that Dan is such an optimist, and I guess I am if you really cut me down the middle, I'm quite brutal with my feedback. So I think when you get to doing what we do, you have to be seen as a consultant. So you have to be ready to have the tough conversation that maybe someone else doesn't want to have. And it's normally with the chief executive and it can even be with the founder. And so you have to be ready to go there and to some, to some degree darn your sword. So we do have those conversations and it can depend on the structure of the organisation. If it's got a big diff sort of difficult shareholding and there's big issues with investment, that brings another layer of complexity to how far they can go and how much they, how brave they can be. And in a traditional media agency or media company, so a publisher, let's say a newspaper company, often they may have the best intention to change the culture and to digitalise and all the things they need to do. But fundamentally, the investors don't want to give up their dividends, so they don't want to invest in the back-end technology that they need to bring the front-end forward. So knowing all of those things will allow a company like ours to decide, and indeed candidates that may consider going there to lead them, whether or not it's worth taking the optimistic risk, which is it's possible to change this. But you've got to look at the ingredients that are there and how much you can influence to take a decision around can I, despite my own personal ability, can I actually move this business around? And every case is individual. Um, so one question that comes on, you mentioned investors. It made me think about the venture capital, the private equity community. So is there a conflict between their desire to create a return and maintaining a culture which is pleasant, happy, creative, etc.? Or have they learned a lesson or do something? I know, Dana, you, come, you have spent many years in private equity, so... You have an inside view on this. Do, do some of them get it, not get it? Is, is so, that way it works? So the answer is not just private equity, but just there are alpha boards of all kinds, you know, whether they be investors. And, and so what, what is happening now is uh, we're trying to fix that structure by getting more women on boards, by opening up boards to not just people who have been grown in these hierarchical cultures, but people who come from technology who have a more openness to collaboration, uh, to try and get boards to understand that they're not police forces that sit on top of companies, but they're really partners with the employee base and to encourage them to go down a level from the executive committee, get to know the team, get to know uh, the business in a different way. And so uh, I think Kathleen made a good point. We're also driven for that quarterly dividend or that quarterly profit that sometimes we don't invest in what is our key resource, which is our people, and to develop those people. And so um, I think, again, taking the optimistic view, things are changing, maybe not as quickly as we'd like. Mills, you build and make your own products, but you also work with some of the biggest, most famous businesses in the world. How, how, how does that come about? What is, what are they, what are their, what is it like when your culture butts up against, as it were, the big, the big corporate culture? I mean, I always just think that at the end of the day, you've got to assume that everyone's human and no one wants to be. I don't think our clients and the designers and people we work with, they want to necessarily be in a bad culture. I'm not saying I'm not talking about any specific things here. I think, I think we've always believed that our culture, our community, our studios are kind of a very vibrant place, very open. There's definitely something in the air that kind of you can just, you just believe in. We, we find that both clients and investors love to just come and spend time in our studios. You know, they, and I think it's, you know, to be inspired again, I mean, there's something about sort of being in a place where you can tell that there's a shared vision of trying to achieve something. So um, I think in terms of investors who, believe, who don't believe in sort of only think about the money side, I think I'm missing a trick now. I think the world's so open now, everyone, now people are going to join places that always, that money's not the only focus for people anymore. Yeah. I think opportunity is what people actually go for. Um, that's what I think. And money, don't get me wrong, you need money, but I think that's just a baseline compared to actually creating opportunity for people. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but it said something. It does, thank you. So one thing I, when we were at the back, we were talking about how we have three women and one bloke, and the women were saying, this is rare. So I had to ask if this, the idea of manhoods and beards was that 
certainly our experience is a lot of the tech and even the creative businesses, probably more so on the tech side, is predominantly led by men. Um, accident, design, bad, good. <laughs> Alison, what's the, I know you're going to be yeah. passionate about this one, yeah. so where's the shift? You know, I, I don't, I don't you know, one, I think, um, I believe in meritocracy, so if you um, work hard and you have great ideas and you want to bring them to the world, it doesn't matter what gender you are. So yeah. I'm, I, I live more in the camp of gender equality than I do in, in Women deserve to be like men. It's, like, that's underestimating me. <laughs> you know, that's like uh, living in a man's world and living by their rules and, and um, uh, grading my success by their definition of success. So I, I don't subscribe to that point of view. But, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, it is dominated by men today. I think that there is clearly, you're seeing a lot of the coverage. You're seeing they're starting to be more transparent about the number of women that they have inside their companies. So it's clearly, to, to Dana's point, there's a consciousness arising um, that diversity in the workplace is what's, what's important. I think if we lived in a world where it was dominated by women in business and, not, and, and men felt like they were the ones who were left out of that club, um, I think that would be weird too. I think what we're looking for is diversity, and not just gender diversity, but diversity in all, of all kinds. So, you know, uh, is it good or bad? Um, I think diversity is the, is, the, is the thing that we need to, to strive for. So um, I, it's, it, what's interesting to me is I'm a hugger. And so uh, when I, you know, I hug Dick Costello or I hit, hug Jack Dorsey, there's always a little, you know, <laughs> what, uh, breath. <laughs> but the younger guys who are coming in is really cute. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, one, of the, one of the young founders that we're working with came up and he goes, I'm giving you a hug. I'm a hugger. And I'm like, amen. Come on. <laughs> Let's go. So it's, you know, there's, there's stuff happening. Good. Excellent. Okay. I'm refusing to grow a beard if that's the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's the fundamental question? The well, women piece. Yeah. I'm speaking with Ariana at 3 o'clock today, so I better get myself on my female game. Yes. I yes. agree with you, which is it's the best person for the job. And there's no reason why that can't be a woman as much as it can be a man. And I think I come up, I'm lucky I come up from a generation, or I'm 42, but I come up from a generation where, in, in certainly in the UK side of the business, although it's slightly different in the US here, you know, in the media industry right now, for example, 50% of media agencies in London are run by women. So things are moving, things are changing, but I think the diversity point is, is almost the next thing we've got to really focus on. I think it's quite shocking. Um, how few people we see on any of these panels or even sometimes in the audience that come from all sorts of different cultures and types and that to me is something that we need to look at. When we ask questions around why, why really is that, the, the fundamental answer we get back more loudly than anything else is that we're not, we're not going back into the grassroots, we're not going into the schools, we're not going to universities, we're not kind of giving them inspirational people to look at to say, that's what I want to do, that's what I'd like to go and do, and we have to think about that as more. But diversity is interesting. One thing I will say on it, although it's an illegal question to ask me, is when we're taking a brief for a job, more often than not, I kind of have that Columbo moment where I'm just putting my hand on the door to go, and the client will say to me, yeah. I'd really like it to be a woman or I'd really like it to be someone from a different minority. So for us, we are often asked to proactively make sure we cover that ground on our long listing. And I'm very understanding about that question. But at the moment, that's an illegal thing to ask me to What's do. Um, and on the candidate side, you know, do you get given advice about how, you know, how to go about the so-called ceilings, be it, a, for that matter, a man as much as a woman? I mean, is do you, do you support people in that journey as they try and navigate Absolutely that? Absolutely so, whether it's through mentoring or with our business, for example, we have psychiatrists, psychologists, dietitians, stylists, everything you might need to help you. Stylists, so, I'll worry about that. <laughs> they're coming your way, Charles. But um, I, think that, I think that it's about supporting the individual for whatever it is they may need in that moment. And we've right. done lots of work, particularly with females, around imposter syndrome and all the stuff that I'm sure we've all talked about before. But it's still in existence, and as, as a species... We are wired differently to men, mm -hmm. and we have to acknowledge what that means and how we can not behave in an alpha way, but actually find a way that works for us as well as individuals. Yeah. But, you know, th there's, two, there's lots of wonderful stats that will also tell you that, that the people that have a, are, are underrepresented by females and indeed other <coughs> diverse um, sides of the business perform much worse than those that have a much more balanced board. And I don't know why we're not taking more notice of that more quickly. Yeah. And Mills, growing... Well, it's not that young a business, but it's young in its spirit. Is this something which crosses the desk? Is it you just trust that the universe will deliver the right mix? Or <clears throat> I think it's a, 
it's been a massive part of the last, I'd say, a year in our studios because it's quite an emotional thing. Actually. I don't think I, for the, I don't think for the, even for the first seven years we were even aware of, of what was happening. I don't think I absolutely know that we never, I never intentionally went out to to somehow create a culture where we've ended up where in the current leadership, if there was a sort of leadership pl platform, it's all men. And I'm, I'm kind of super devastated that that's gone that way. I, I, I'm, I've never done that on purpose, but it's happened. I think there's a big societal play in this as well. I think we're super aware now. And we're trying to work out how to change that. Mm. Um, you know, I don't believe in just suddenly saying, right, it's just... 50-50 just for the sake of it but at the same time somehow we've created a culture whereby it's gone that way um, and so something has to change there I think I think if we want to be a culture whereby and we talk and a community which is like empowers everybody then somehow along the line I failed somewhere so that's something we're looking at big, but I think it's a big, I think it's a big <laughs> problem everywhere, everywhere right now but it's definitely I mean it's been talked about all the time certainly in our studio it comes up an awful lot and we're trying to work out together how we can change this and what the best way is to change this I mean knowing your business as I do I mean one thing which it might be worth sharing is you purposely shut down as it were or changed your leadership because you found that you got yourself into that corner so yeah, you've, I, now, you've now changed it to allow everyone to have a. Yeah, no, we have nothing. It's perfect. I don't recommend that. But um, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I, think, I, I, I wasn't seeing how it was able to change quick enough if it was based on who was running the studios or the shareholders, or it, it was just not. There's no. There was no way in. So I think actually that was definitely a big part of playing in, in disassembling that and saying, look, actually leadership isn't going to be about your position in the company or, your, or what percentage of the company you own anymore. That's that's nonsense. That's that's another metric. Um, and we can we can accelerate that now by uh, and and look for equality across the board. And I'm talking about young and old, everything. Um, yeah. okay. It's hard though. I tell you, yeah. I, I, I I challenge myself all the time with <laughs> it. Like, what the fuck went on wrong? But no. yeah. No, I, I think what everyone's saying makes so much sense to me. It's diversity of thought. For the first time in the last month or so, I've introduced some top talent into companies. And the jury from the company said, gee, they're 50 years old, they're too old. So I'm seeing, you know, no, that's, that's gone, eh? <laughs> the, the lack of understanding that bringing in some wisdom and cu culture is not just shutting down to uh, different genders, but different points of view, different ages, you know, different ways of life. And I think, you know, that's totally unhealthy for, for culture. You oh, know? Absolutely. I think it's. It's really finding those common purposes and putting people in the right seats and, you know, diversity of thought. That's the way I like to exactly. think of it is, is what makes a company better and, you know, creating that understanding. So it, it may sound a little Pollyanna, but, uh, um, you know, I, I get the briefs also where they tell me, you know, not too tall, not too short, not too old, not too young, you know. And I say I'm bringing you the best athlete wherever they are, you can decide who you're going to hire. My job is to bring you best athletes, yeah, you know. Um, but that kind of prejudice does exist. And, and I always tell people, you know, sometimes you need to hire an alien, somebody outside of the culture, somebody who's different, who brings different ideas to evolve the culture. And so, you know, it's that diversity that makes it richer and more interesting. I think that's quite prevalent in this particular sector as well. So we like to have some wild cards, as we would call them, on our, on our um, long list slate. And to me, it's about, is someone able to run this company? Do they have the prerequisite skills to do that, whether or not they have worked at a creative agency or a digital specialist or whatever it may be? And I find, particularly in the creative agency culture, they find that quite difficult to, to get their head around that someone hasn't spent 10 years at JWT or wherever it may be. And I find that quite challenging personally because I think they probably could move a bit faster if they were able to accept that at leadership level, so long as you know how to lead, an, uh, lead a company, you can probably transfer your skills to a different sector. And yeah. I think we need to be a bit braver, particularly in the advertising industry, around that. Great. Good point. Um, I'm going to ask you guys if you have any questions in a minute so you can prep that. Um, one last question for the panel, which is putting you slightly on the spot, uh, and I haven't warned them about this question. Um, if we were going to think about, let's say, in five years' time looking back, are there some young businesses you know of where you'll see, you see, and I'm sure we can have Mills' company on the list, uh, which will be sort of beacons of light in this, people who are 
so these guys can go and check out perhaps this afternoon what, what are the what are the leading businesses out there who who's really trying to do stuff differently and also being productive because there's there's also ones which you know do do go a bit too extreme and don't succeed so i'm looking for businesses who are creating great cultures but also are successful in developing their products or providing a particular service does anyone want to shout out a couple of names or a name which I resonates think uber, uber may be one i don't know how you guys feel but every time i get in a car with an uber driver uh, and try to engage them. How are you doing? How do you like Uber? They tell me how they love yeah. the company and how mm -hmm. it's changed their life. And I'm thinking the same thing. You know, I get that text that says John's going to pick me up, and he rolls down the window, and I say, hi, John. And he <laughs> says, hi, Dana. And I get in the car with a stranger. Oh, my God, my mother told me I wasn't supposed to talk to strangers, let alone get to change cars, you yeah. know? And here's this automatic trust, and we are all part of the same community. So I think uh, uh, it's just an example of uh, a brand that's developed that has trust and has a culture that both their customers and their employees sort of resonate to. Awesome. There's a tiny little company that we're working with, just to, starting to work with, and it's called Earnest, and it's about the future of banking. They want to basically... Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, very big ambitions. Um, but it was the first time that I've heard a company, and we're, we're talking um, seriously early in the sense that they're getting ready to go out and raise their Series A. Um, so they're, you know, very early stage. And it's the first time that I've heard a leadership team really talking about the importance of culture. And one of the, the, the critical hires, most of the companies in the startup um, space are looking for engineering talent, engineering talent, engineering talent. They say, no, we want a chief culture officer. We want somebody who's really going to focus on helping us to build a really healthy culture. And uh, it, was, it was so refreshing. It, you know, it, was, it was one of those moments where I was just joyful. You know? yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Kathleen, are you allowed to I mention names? Too. You can have two, by all means. I'm yeah. only going to mention two because I, was, um, I introduced a panel uh, yesterday that had a number of different media companies right across the space, and there were two that, were very, that you would class as very different, but both of them in their own way, I think, are emerging with quite exciting plans. So one of them sounds quite traditional thought, but Mashable, the way that Mashable deal with themselves in the market, I think is unbelievable. And I think whether it's Seth Rogen from the commercial side, who's obviously a laugh a minute, but super, super bright and very prepared to put his name out there and, and to, you know, for example, says we've got to ban the word native because it's just utterly ridiculous. So I love the fact that they're brave, they're transparent, they're very clear about what they're doing. Pete's obviously very dynamic, but the way that they hire, we hire for them, and the way that they hire is so particular and makes it very easy for us to do, but I'm very clear what they're trying to do. The other, I would say, traditionally, is Bloomberg. I'm really watching what Bloomberg are doing at the moment. If you look at who they've been hiring into that business, so Jackie Kelly as an example, but you've got some people they've been hiring across Europe as well, and the products they're intending to bring to the market and to really revolutionise the way you think about them, I'm really fascinated by that. On the panel yesterday, they were the two that stuck out by a country right. mile for being very clear about their purpose. Piers, for you, Mills, people you <coughs> aspire or respect, uh, it's too hard a question. I'm just going to put out that you said five years' time. I mean, as you know of all people, you know, a mission I have personally is to make sure that we distribute, you know, pretty much all the wealth that this company, that us two generates to everybody in the community, in our community, and that's something that I feel very strongly about. So now that you're filming it, I've got to do it. So I, I'm not, I, for me, I've always had a massive issue with companies that kind of hoard most of the cash for, like, the, of the minor few. I think that, that has to change, and that's actually... Kind of the next few years for me is getting out and talking about that. So, yeah, I want to get rid of as much of the cash and distribute it to everybody because ultimately the people in my community are the ones that are going to be creating the great ideas of the future. So yeah. they need to be looked after. So. Brilliant. Okay. Any questions for the floor? I, by the way, I can barely see <laughs> beyond about three feet. So we have a hand up on the, on the corner there if a microphone can get there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Artie mentioned... Uh, the idea that board members should drill down deeper and get to know more about the companies and the culture. Uh, in my experience, there are some board members who want to do that, and there are a whole lot of people in middle management who want to talk to the board members. There seems to be a layer in between, um, such as the chief executive uh, and uh, other people at that level. Do you have any comment on the role of those people in facilitating or impeding that communication? Yeah. Um I just wrote an article uh, last month for corporate boards and directors 
about how boards can start to engage the community. Um, and, you know, they'll hire McKinsey or outside consultants before they'll go talking to the troops about what's in the best interest of the community. So, you know, I suggested a process where uh, they develop what I call the Citizens Committee, where, you know, it becomes a, um, a sort of opportunity for high potentials who may succeed uh, uh, to leadership positions to take that leadership to be you know, a filter in between the board and the management team uh, uh, to enhance both the executive committee and the board vis-a-vis uh, -vis the community and their gurus in their particular functions. And so, you know, again, it's a change of behavior. It's a different way of thinking. And, you know, uh, um, I know when I was in private equity, that was really important to us that, you know, as board members, we reach down in the community, and you know, uh, uh, when I sat on a board, I'm, I still to this day see people who are, are at all levels at the organization who still know me, who still understand that they could feel comfortable talking to me about how things are going in the business, and not be apologetic for their points of view. And I think, you know, again, it's teaching different behavior and selecting boards in a different way, and people who are open to listening and then helping, you know, this uh, citizens committee learn how to bring things to a board level to create that dialogue, because that's healthy after all. Um, and so uh, this is a soapbox I'm on, and I'm talking with boards and talking with companies, trying to teach them how to do this, because it's a different behavior. And uh, again, it gets messy. You ask people, you get points of view, and then what do you do with them? Well, that's what you have to learn. How do you take those points of view? And, and not everything has to be actionable, but you have to listen because there are things in there that are evolutionary that will happen and will help you be a better organization. Another question? Stevie Quart, one in the corner. Um, <clears throat> I've been fortunate enough to work for two companies, both of which uh, have been filled with wonderful people, and actually the the consistent theme is, and quoting the Netflix Netflix CEO, is that they just don't hire assholes um, or brilliant assholes. Um, for me, there's a lot of human resources departments. Well, in itself, being called human resources are kind of archaic. For me, I, I feel like that's where the investment needs to be made in an attitude towards hiring and an attitude towards people. Um, do you think that's fair? Uh, that, that's a fair comment because for me, the idea of that filtering too hard from the top down it is tough. Catherine. So I have a love-hate relationship with HR departments. So as a, as a rule, as a company, as a headhunting firm, we don't tend to deal with HR departments at all. We tend to deal with the chief executives directly in, um, and from there we tend to get a real sense of what the issue is. That said, there's lots of chief talent officers emerging, there's lots of culture officers emerging that are actually doing a very different job. And I think that, um, for example, Facebook, the client of ours, they have a huge internal talent resource. They try and headhunt all their own people, and so they should, and if they can, then brilliant. But there are times at leadership level where having someone call you up from Dublin who's never met you, who's read your profile on LinkedIn, and approaches you about a role that actually ends up being rather irrelevant can be very offensive. And there are candidates who will not go and work there because somebody offended them two and a half years ago on a random call that someone from the HR department made. And I think that some of the tech firms particularly need to think about that because I've seen some devastating relationships go horribly wrong because the approach just wasn't quite right, wasn't well enough thought through. So at the worst situation, that can happen. I think having said that, there are some wonderful HR individuals that are at the top of companies. There's someone at AOL that I'm thinking of who does an incredible job. But again, that comes back to where's the relationship with HR to the board and where's the relationship with the HR director to the chief executive and the, and the operating team. If that relationship's very tight and culturally they understand what they're looking for, it can be a very dynamic position to have. But unfortunately, over time, sometimes I see businesses where HR is a sort of evil necessity that has to sit down the corridor. And when that's the situation, I, just, I think it can almost do more harm than good. And that's quite outspoken, but I, I see it every day. So I feel very strongly about it. Human resources, uh, in terms of the tactical side of human resources, uh, I think a lot of companies are realizing they can outsource them, get them off balance sheet. And if you believe that people are your strategy, which is something that I think uh, Kathleen is talking about, then 
your chief people officer or your chief strategist or your chief learning officer becomes really key to the growth and operations of your business. And I think we're seeing more of those roles emerge in companies. Okay. And time for one more question, I think. Stay in silence. Okay. I think the key is just not to work for companies that have these ridiculous names. I mean, I mean and uh, you know, don't work at a company that's got a board. I mean, it's very easy to say that, but I think, why would it, I just can't imagine why anyone would want to work in a company that's got so bloated and big, really. I think the future is definitely about smaller and, and you know, big companies with lots of small versions. Of course, that sounds like my one, but um, yeah, it just seems scary. Anyway. So you, you won't be having an HR manager? No, HR's a weird one. No. But if I get part of the wealth, I could come, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Please, come this way. I'm in. <laughs> So lastly then, just for the panel then, yeah. in terms of uh, uh, if, if you were coaching, advising a leader, or you are a leader, if you wanted to pass on one single thought to, let's say you're handing the business over to a new leadership team, what sort of ingredient would you want the leader to acknowledge and make sure is passed on? It's a bit like those heritage tracks for music. So what's the one thought you would want to I, make sure they hand over? Well, I kind of say because well, I remember others, I forget it. I mean, I think it's like, I believe, like, listen to as many people as possible, but ultimately realise it's okay to make a decision. I think that's, I've fallen down that so many times. You can't please anybody, everybody. Um, but definitely try to get as much information as possible to make that decision. And then go with it. Alison, and learn. Your, your inheritance tract of leadership, as it were? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think it is about... I think um, uh, Mill said this, lead from a place of authenticity and vulnerability. And, and I think um, that if you live in your truth and, and, and the team understands that, that they'll come along. So. Kathleen. Always remain congruent. Whatever you're telling your team, they have to believe that you believe it too. And I think you have to play in a space that you're very comfortable with and you're willing to go across. They'll, they'll, they'll get behind you and go across the trenches if they think you're being honest and congruent with them. Lastly, then, embrace change yeah. because change happens. Right. Absolutely. And on that note, thank you. We've run out of time. So, first of all, oh, well, <laughs> thanks to Mills, Kathleen, Alison, and Donna, and thanks for all your time tonight. Thank you. Oh.